Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Turnbull, and I am VP of Partnerships and Legal Affairs at Open Sesame, also one of the co-founders. And I am very pleased today to introduce you to J.D. Dillon, who is the Chief Learning Architect for Exonify, uh, one of Open Sesame's partners. Um, they're wonderful to partner with. Um, J.D. has been in the learning and development industry for decades, um, including a very long run at Disney. So we are very excited to uh, uh, chat with uh, JD today and, and uh, learn about some of the things that he is working on. Cool. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Tom, for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, we're going to talk about content today. So hopefully you're in the right place for kind of a, a quick to the point 30 minute conversation about uh, evolving content strategy, especially in the, the challenging working environments we're in today. So this is the first part of a two part conversation. In part one, we're gonna dig into, well, why is there a content problem? What are the common obstacles we see that organizations are faced with when it comes to connecting the right people to the right content to solve the right problems? We're gonna talk about how you make content fit. So what is, when we say good content, right? What, what makes content, good and what makes it a right fit to solve the problems that you're looking to overcome as an organization and then finally how do you get strategic with the ways that you source and build and develop your content catalog your content libraries so we're going to talk about adopting more of a curation mindset as part of our conversation today so tom are, are you ready is everyone else ready can we dive in i'm ready Showing sounds you? great let's go all right, let's dive in. As Tom introduced, I'm JD from Exonify. Exonify is a, a digital communication and training technology company focused on enabling frontline workers around the world. So the folks who work in grocery stores, retail stores, delivery drivers, manufacturing facilities, contact center agents, those types of teams. So we support millions of people around the world in a variety of countries and languages when it comes to developing the knowledge and skills they need to be successful on the job. And a big part of our strategy and of the way that we leverage technology relates directly to also our content efforts. So a lot of people don't know that Exonify is also a content company. So we've built our own content marketplace, a very nuanced topic focused on specific knowledge points, specific behaviors and skills that frontline employees need to be successful in those types of roles. And we're very excited to be partnered with Open Sesame, where you can both access Open Sesame content in the Exonify platform, as well as you can actually access a selection of Exonify content via Open Sesame to use within your own learning technology. So it's a great partnership. And hopefully in our conversations, uh, both today and in part two, you'll kind of get a sense of how we look at content strategically to make sure we can suit the needs and solve the problems that frontline workers or workers in general face in the uh, work that they do in the modern environment. So when we talk about content, that's kind of a, a, that's a big word. There can be a lot of things in content. And a lot of people might go straight at online courses, right? It's an hour long course, uh, all things safety one, one type of piece of content. We are definitely talking about online courses in the story, but we're also talking about a wide array of digital assets. So it could be a course, could be a video, could be a job aid, could be an article. So we talk about the word content, we're referencing the wide variety of different types of content objects, materials, information that you can deploy to your audience to help them improve their skills and solve a particular problem. So the big question we're going to try to solve over the course of our time together is, why is it just so hard to get the right content to the right person at the right time so that they can improve what they're doing, improve their performance, and solve a problem in the workplace? And there's a wide variety of challenges that you face. As someone who ran content development teams, built a lot of materials, uh, both at Disney and as well in my, in my role at Kaplan supporting contact centers, I've seen a variety of challenges when it comes to the role that content plays. Content obviously isn't the entire puzzle when it comes to learning and performance support, but it's a big part of the story. And as a result, there are a lot of different challenges. But some of the most common challenges I see organizations face are one, a lot of the content's overstuffed, right? Maybe the operation said that you have access to this employee for one hour and we need you to cover all 300 slides in that one hour. So we just crammed a lot of information into our legacy content and really didn't think about the fact that people just can't consume, yet alone retain that much information. So a lot of content just kind of overflowing with information. A lot of content because of that doesn't quite hit the mark. It's not quite relevant for everyone who maybe receives that training. It's one of those scenarios where everyone gets the training, but no one really needed it. 
because the content isn't quite focused enough, because limitations are making us put a lot of information into these kind of larger, often irrelevant uh, formats. In a lot of cases, it's just hard to keep up. So a lot of content is slow to deploy. You have to go through a, a whole process. You have to identify the needs, work with stakeholders, build initial drafts, get those approved. And by the time you get to the end of the design process, the problem's already changed. And now you have to work on the next cycle. So how do we accelerate the content process is a big part of our conversation. To be frank, content's expensive, right? Whether it's budget when you're buying content resources, whether it's the amount of time and effort and resource you put into building content, it's a big line item when it comes to HR and learning and development uh, resources. So making sure that we acknowledge that we spend a lot of time and resource on content, we have to make sure to get the value we need out of that investment and also look for ways we can, we can maximize that investment. A lot of content is difficult to access. One of my favorite things I ever asked one of my teams back in the day was, how many clicks does it take to play a video when we upload it to our learning management system? And someone went off and, and clicked through from you know, the intranet to the HR portal, to the learning management system, to the curricula, et cetera, et cetera. It required seven clicks to play that video. And then I asked, how many clicks does it play, take to play a video on YouTube? The answer is one. And that's the bar we're up against. So how do we make sure content is as easily accessed as possible when and where people need it? And then finally, there's a lot of content that's not very engaging, whether that be compliance material and you know, people have to sit in this chair for an hour to watch the videos about a certain compliance topic, or maybe it's just because you didn't have time to think about the engagement factor. You know, remember that training can be fun too. So that's just another of the many obstacles that I often see in organizations that I work with when it comes to revamping or rethinking content strategy. And I'm interested to see like what boxes do we check? Are you facing other obstacles? When we drop our contact information later, um, let us know or in a chat uh, module if there's one available to you. Let us know what obstacles you're facing when it comes to your own content strategy or if you're facing any of these. And ultimately it comes down to the fact that it, it, a lot of times feels like we're trying to take a legacy content strategy square peg and fit it into the modern realities of how people need to be supported round hole and it's just not fitting. So hopefully in this conversation, given I'm going pretty quickly, we can help you start to rethink some of the key components of your content strategy so that we can kind of will down the square peg so it ultimately fits effectively into the round hole. Let's get the most out of this stock art that we possibly can in this conversation. But we're gonna start off by talking about what makes good content. So four characteristics of content that really fits the needs of employees in the modern workplace. And I put micro learning in parentheses because a lot of these practices relate directly to the concept of micro learning. We're not gonna go deep into micro learning today. I've done many hours on that before if you wanna go, go over there. But a lot of the conversation aligns because micro learning ultimately comes down to building right fit resources to help solve the right problem at the right time. So our first characteristic, right fit content. It needs to fit a business problem. It's not just content for the sake of content. You invested in this material, you bought this material, you built this material because it's gonna solve a specific meaningful problem. So you have to begin the design process or the decision-making process with what's the specific measurable goal we're trying to achieve here. And the answer can't be safety because that's not a goal, that's a word specifically within safety, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And how is that problem measured, right? How did you know it was a problem? Because once you know the problem that you're facing, you can then work your way down the path to say, okay, great. Now, what, does, what has to change in the operation when it comes to employee behavior to help us achieve that goal? So and then, you, just let me uh, ask, yep. a, ask a quick question. Sure. So in this context, what uh, you know, going beyond the word safety, what would a specific measurable goal for uh, a typical Exonify uh, customer be? Sure. So instead of, let's say we have, we want to re, the conversation may start with, we want to reinvigorate the safety culture. Great idea, right? So let's now talk about where are the areas that people are actually getting hurt? What are the specific challenges that you're facing when it comes to safety? And let's identify what those issues are. And in one case, maybe it pops up that people are experiencing back injuries because they're improperly lifting items within uh, the warehouse area. So instead of building a training about safety, we're going to start with the goal of reducing back injuries as a great place to start when it comes to building out a catalog of content to address different types of problems to get to that big goal, which is reinvigorate the safety culture, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great example. 
Awesome. So we've said, that's the goal. This is the behavior we want to see. We want to see people lifting appropriately, bending at the knees, keeping the arms in, all of the things that lead to a safe and effective lift. What do people have to know in order to do that on the job? So in that case, it's what are the kind of foundational steps of an effective lift? What tools do I have available? What safety gear should I be using to make that lift? And then we can make the decision, well, this is the right way to solve the problem through content. So we can decide here, are we building a course? Are we building a video? Are we building a video and a job aid? So it opens the doors to a wide variety of different types of content solutions once we narrow down to the specific business problem that we're trying to fit our solution up against. So that's principle number one, your content has to fit a business problem. Number two, it has to fit how learning works, right? Because like I said, people are people. We can only consume so much, retain so much information over time. So our content strategy has to align with how people work because we can't just expect someone to sit down, watch a two hour course and walk away having learned all of those things. And I, I know there are gonna be situations where you have to deliver the 60 minute course because the regulator requires that specific piece of content. We can overcome that challenge with a more integrated content strategy once we focus in on the fact that people are not gonna walk away from those 60 minutes with all of the information that your subject matter expert thought was crucial for them to know just because it's not how people function. And you know what I mean. So in this case, we have to think about a couple of core learning science ideas. First, we have to make content easy to consume by focusing again down on a specific challenge. So instead of all things safety, and no one remembers all the different points from that content, when we focus on specific behaviors related to back injuries, that's much easier to walk away with. And another thing that makes it easier to retain is when you connect that content to real world application. Because if you, if you talk again about a broad safety course, 50, 60% of that may not relate to my job. I may not be using all of that information. So now the entire experience is becoming less engaging because this training really isn't meant for me and I have to figure out what, what works. When the content is narrowed and focused down on specific relatable job skills and behaviors, I can see directly how this training on how to lift effectively directly relates to what I do every day, which requires a lot of lifting within the logistics operation or within the warehouse environment. And then finally, it has to be easy to reinforce because we have to remember again, people are built to forget. It is likely that you forgot half of what I've said already, even though I know it's very insightful and entertaining. So how do we reinforce this information down the line to drive long-term retention? And again, reinforcing everything from that hour long safety training is much more challenging than finding ways to reinforce specific behaviors, whether it be through coaching, whether that be through practice activities that happen on the job, through question based reinforcement. There's a variety of ways we can reinforce those key knowledge and skill points when we build it, the idea into our overall content strategy. Because, like I said, frankly, that's just how learning works. So we have to design solutions that match that and not try to fight against the reality of realities of just to be frank, you know, science and whatnot. Do you, uh, do you have another, oh, another question for you? Sure. Um, do you see an optimal length of a course? I mean, this kind of goes to your, your mention of micro learning, but mm -hmm. is there in your experiences at Exonify, because we see a, just a tremendous range of course lengths and formats. Uh, are you, are you honing in on a specific um, length of time? Yes, and the correct answer is as short as it needs to be. Shorter so the, the magic answer, right? The magic answer is there is no specific number. And when it comes to micro learning, especially, I've seen people say things like, well, the perfect amount of perfect size of content is four minutes and 37 seconds. Like there's no there's no science behind that. Mm -hmm. There's a basic facts to be had that people can only consume and retain so much information, um, especially if you're not going to use it immediately after the training, um, especially if you don't know how to relate it to what you're doing in your job or your past experience. So there's a lot of considerations there when it comes to how learning works. But the easiest way to say it is as short and focused as possible. And if you can't break things down to that very granular a skill specific or knowledge specific element, and you have to say, do a 35 minute course on a topic, mm -hmm. then you need to build in those reinforcement elements and those performance support elements to crutch the fact that people are going to forget some of the things you trained them on. So they have to have those additional support elements mm -hmm. so they can go find the information, they can practice with the information, and that'll drive that long-term retention and overcome the kind of basic limits of that initial training event. Mm -hmm. I wish there was a number.
yeah. not a number. Yep. The other thing that's going to drive into that, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is also, well, how much time do people have? Right? Because in a lot of cases, maybe you're talking about a retail employee, and the only time they have available for continuous training is the three to five minutes they have right after they clock in before they hit the sales floor. Guess what the magic number now is? Three to five minutes. So now we have to build our content strategy around their availability, which is where we're sitting right now. Great transition work, Tom. I'm really liking it. Great transition work because we're talking about the flow of work now. So like I said, it's not just about designing content based on learning science. We also have to look at the everyday reality of the audience the content is intended for. Mm -hmm. And if it's you're designing for me and I sit in front of a computer all day, that's a very different scenario than someone who drives a lift truck and has very minimal time within the flow of their day and is very difficult to remove from the operation because if they're not driving the lift truck, products aren't getting shipped. So we really have to take a look at the flow of work for the audience you're supporting, how they access uh, information in that flow of work, and how can we leverage the same tools, the same devices within the time they have available in order to deliver solutions. So that it's more of the kind of um, more common for people to experience content and training as part of their job. And we only have to remove people from the operation when it's absolutely required because that becomes disruptive to the operation. It's the last thing we wanna do as learning and development. Awesome. And then number four, fits the moment of need. So making sure that your content is designed for how it really needs to be used. And a simple example here would be, let's say someone's using Excel a lot as part of their job. The answer to how do I format a cell in a particular way can't be buried in that 35 minute introduction to Excel video, because that just makes it difficult to use because I forgot that piece of formatting when we had the training. And now it's six months later, I, need, I can't remember how to format the cell. Again, very kind of basic example. So make sure that we're designing content for how it's intended to be used. Is this meant to help people in the flow of work solve a problem, more of a performance support mechanism? Is this something that requires more of a sit down focused experience where we're really drilling into a new concept um, or is it somewhere in between? So if a job aid will solve the problem, you should build a job aid. If a video will solve the problem in the right way and can be used within the flow of work, video solves the problem. If it requires more of an interactive course, then you go to that piece. But you have to make sure that we're thinking about how content is meant to be used as part of the working experience so people don't get frustrated with a mismatch between when they experience the problem and the type of content that you've made available. So that's our four kind of ways to build or practices or proven ideas around making sure your content design fits the reality of the audience you're trying to support as a first place to kind of begin evolving your content strategy. But the biggest thing we're gonna talk about today isn't instructional design theory, it isn't about a specific type of content, it really comes down to rethinking the way we come at content strategy overall, that mindset shift that's required at all levels of the organization, whether it's the instructional design team, whether it's management, whether it's stakeholders, a lot of people kind of have these default modes where we solve a problem using the same process, same methodology, same types of content every time. And frankly, a lot of L&D people, including myself, uh, we start as builders. Right, we're using rapid authoring tools, we're using video, my background's in media production, which is why I have an awkward three-point lighting setup for every meeting that I'm in right now. You can see it in my glasses if you look closely. We start as builders in a lot of cases where we want to put together the best possible material that's engaging, that's fun, that's exciting, that you know, drives an impact. But then you quickly start to realize you can't keep up that way unless you have a lot of resources. It's very challenging to keep up if you focus on always trying to build a resource. That means we have to focus on specific challenges, the high priority projects, and a lot of things get left behind in that regard. So rather than focus on just building, building will always be a, an important part of our content strategy. We have to think more from a curation perspective. We're not gonna write every book in the library. We're gonna write the correct books and then we're gonna find access to the information in other places to populate that total library. So we can get solutions out more quickly, we can reduce the overall effort required to connect people to the right content. We can get the best value out of our content strategy, our content investment, and then ultimately drive the impact the organization and the people we support need to see. So it begins with that shift in mindset from builder first to curator first. And then applying within that curation strategy, uh, what I call and what I've seen other people call the 3B approach to content, which is 
Are we going to build? Are we going to buy? Or are we going to borrow? And I want to break down each idea uh, in, a, in a bit in terms of when is the right time to build content, when are you going to buy content, and when should you borrow content, and how does this holistically come together to create a more efficient, high-impact content strategy. Let's start where you don't expect us to start at the end of the puzzle with borrow, because that's actually where everything should begin. Right? What resources are already available within your reach from open, um, potentially free, complimentary, whatever term you want to use, resources? So it could be the internet at large, could be TED Talk, could be YouTube video, and it very much could be the knowledge and insight of your team. So your frontline workers, the people who are doing the jobs every day, subject matter experts, how can you crowdsource material from all of these already available resources to potentially solve the problem more quickly? So when should you look at borrowing content? When it's a topic does not require specific, highly vetted expertise. You can leverage the wisdom of the crowd without worrying about having to get the kind of ultimately approved version of a piece of information. That information is reliable from open, trusted sources, including the people, again, in your organization. Information just changes too quickly. So sometimes it's easier to keep pace with rapid change by leveraging your subject matter experts directly rather than trying to play middleman between subject matter experts and the people who need to know that information by always trying to build more formal training resources. How do you just connect the two and get out of the way given how fast maybe product information is changing within your business? And then if you just have limited time, limited resources, limited budget, you just can't build or you can't buy a solution for a particular problem. That's when you wanna look at potentially the borrow side of curation. And as I said, that could include a wide variety of resources online with citations, of course, uh, videos, open source educational sites, and crowdsourced information from within your own organization. So whenever I look at solving a problem that requires a content solution, the first place I start is how do we crowdsource this information, curate it by borrowing the insight and wisdom of the crowd as a first stop. And then if we can't solve the problem entirely by borrowing, we move to the next stage, which is buy. So at this point, we're now gonna reach out to trusted partners in order to access high quality vetted content on specific topics. So maybe there's someone out there that has already solved this problem and means that you don't have to do it yourself. My favorite example is ladder safety. No one should ever build a basic ladder safety training course again. We've got that covered unless you have a very special ladder within your organization. Maybe the topic is highly regulated. Maybe it's unique to your region. Maybe it's hard to keep up with a constantly changing regulation in a state like California and a trusted expert's a better place to go rather than have your own resource internally to try to keep pace with your content. Or it's a problem that you're, you're trying to solve that's not proprietary in nature. It's a common skill set, something that something you pull off of the shelf from a trusted partner may help you solve more effectively than you having to build your own version of that. So that includes everything from you know, highly durable human skills, foundational business skills, core technology skills. And I know, Tom, this is a, an area that you're yep. especially expert, expert in when it comes to your work with Open Sesame. So what are your thoughts on how people should think about the buy piece of content curation? Yeah, this is the discussion that we have every day uh, in spades at Open Sesame. So we're often talking to a learning and development leader who may have a specific budget, right? And then we'll uh, look at what their learning goals are and, and what they're looking to do over the next year and help them figure out um, how to put those three pieces together and, and maximize their budget and maximize the impact on their organization. So yeah, certain things should be built out by, by either internal staff or maybe an outside contractor that's building um, bespoke courses. Um, but in most cases, uh, uh, learning programs can be put together through uh, programs like we have available at Open Sesame, um, or through, as you've mentioned, any number of other free sources that are available on the web. Um, I think at this point, uh, depending on how you define these terms, YouTube is the biggest training provider in the world. If you look at everything that they do, I mean, anytime I want to do something home improvement related, for example, I'm looking to YouTube for a how-to video, and there's a lot of great content out there that's available for free. Um, but these are the discussions that we have every day. At Open Sesame, what we've done is we've made the, the buy part of it simple in that we've aggregated content from hundreds of different providers. So we have tens of, tens of thousands of courses in pretty much any topic you can think of that lends itself nicely to online training. So yeah, again, these are the discussions that we have every day. Um, bringing it back to you and some of your, your discussions that you have along, uh, along these lines, do you see a particular kind of a mix 
emerging with with uh, with your customers. So, for example, you know, make up numbers a third, a third, a third in terms of those three categories, or some other type of of mix, or does it depend? I think the key is that it very much depends, and the idea of being flexible and how you kind of pull the three different levers in order to solve different problems. So one of the points at the end of our conversation is around the idea that it's not or, right? It's not borrow or buy or build to solve a problem. It, as long as you're breaking content down and using those four principles, we started talking about really focusing on content that fits, that opens the door for you to say, well, if I buy this foundational training from this provider, and then maybe I build some supplementary information that kind of contextualizes that foundational skill set to specifically what we're doing here. And then maybe I crowdsource some frequently asked questions or some overcoming obstacle information from the crowd. That gives me a much more holistic solution to the entire challenge that I can manage in different ways rather than saying, well, I have to build all of that myself or you know, I have to just rely on generic content and it never really quite hits the mark for us. It's about balancing the three different factors together. And that balancing act very much changes depending on the problem you face. Is it regulatory related? Um, is it very proprietary to your business? It's very much a sliding scale, which mm -hmm. is what makes it so critical that organizations have all three levers available to them in their strategies. Mm -hmm. Right. Awesome. Last lever. We talked about two of them. Now let's talk about build. So the idea here is that this is the last resort. So only if you can't borrow or buy do you get to the point of building. This is when the problem is very specific to what you're dealing with. This is a product or service that you sell. This is a specific process that you execute within your business. Content just isn't available anywhere else on this subject, and you need that content to solve the problem. So that's your only option. So that's when we should use the limited resources we have, the specialist teams that we have to build those robust offerings. And again, it could be in combination with other resources that you've pulled um, from other partners or maybe from crowdsourcing. So this is again, when it's very specific guidelines, um, something that needs to be used on demand within your workflow in a very nuanced way, or again, maybe those add-on materials that add greater context and usability to content that you're sourcing from other locations. And because, like I said, build's the last resort, but it doesn't go away as part of the story. Building's still an important thing that we're gonna do as a learning and development function. But the question becomes, because things change so quickly, how do we build even faster? Mm -hmm. Because I've actually met learning and development teams that in some cases are five years in, I'm not joking, five years into a content development process. How is the problem even possibly still the same that far in, yet alone, three, six, eight months, how long it commonly takes to build out a training program. So how do we get faster and more agile in our development process? So I have something to show as kind of an example of this. Tom, have you seen uh, something that's new from Exonify? We're currently in early release mode called our Artificial Intelligence Content Assistant. I haven't seen it. I've heard mention of it, and I'm looking forward to learning more about it. All right, let's take a, just a minute or two before we wrap up today to show you a quick demonstration of how Content Assistant works in Exonify. So let's take a quick look at some of the work we're doing in Exonify when it comes to content automation with our AI-based Content Assistant. We're now in the Exonify platform under the administrative section within the content area. The first thing we have to do is go ahead and create a new topic. So in this case, we're gonna be creating some content around the planet Mars. So I'm gonna create a topic called Mars. Now you can see I have this option to be able to upload source information. So I can select a PDF, a document, a text file with source or foundational information about this particular topic. So I'm gonna browse my computer and upload a PDF document about the planet Mars. So I've uploaded the document. If we go ahead and uh, take a click here and I'll, I'll actually open it up for you to show you what we're working with. Here's just a document with various interesting insights and information into the planet, some facts and figures that we want to get across to the users of the platform in both training and reinforcement. So when we go back uh, here, we now have the option for generating content. So when I click the generate button from Content Assistant, it gives me the option to create either key learning points, which would identify what are the key areas or key elements of this particular source material, as well as key learning points and multiple choice questions. So those questions we're going to use to generate a baseline level of knowledge and also reinforce these key learning points with our Exonify audience. So I'm going to select both key learning points and multiple choice questions and click generate. 
And now content assistant gets to work. I can step away, go do something else, grab a beverage, continue working on uh, another task and come back in just a couple of minutes to see what content assistant comes up with. All right, it's been about three or four minutes. We come back and we see that content assistant has finished generating our key learning points and our multiple choice questions. So when we jump into the content area under our topic Mars, we can see two things. First, here's our list of key learning points. And again, what the content assistant did was use natural language understanding to parse out what are the key pieces of information that we want people to know based on the source material provided. And then for each of those key learning points, it wrote a reinforcement or assessment question. So here we can see it ask questions like, what's the name of the red planet? A very basic question all the way down to for this giant equatorial rift valley that stretches across Mars, um, how far does it stretch? Let's dive into that question. So we can see here it generated the question, the correct answer, distractor options, and an explanation for why that is the correct answer. So here we can see the correct answer is that that giant equatorial rift valley stretches from New York to Los Angeles, but then it gave different uh, other locations as uh, potential comparison points. So the idea here of content assistant is not that it's necessarily creating a final question. It's helping the instructional designer accelerate that content development process. So they've got that first phase where they've uh, prepared the source material, dropped it into the content assistant, let the machine take that first kind of swipe at designing the information, and now come in before we release the question, because you can see here it's in pending status, and actually make adjustments. So maybe I don't like all the distractor options provided here. So I just click into the question and I can see here that it, maybe I, I don't like the Florida to Texas option, but at just a quick point here, you'll notice that Florida and Texas and San Francisco and Seattle aren't in the source material. So what Content Assistant did is actually use its greater understanding of information related to this concept in order to introduce that information to make a stronger question. So it'll use that additional understanding to write the question and also create those distractor options. But an instructional designer can then come in if you want to uh, type in adjustments to the question, you can do that here. Or again, maybe I don't like this Florida to Texas option, it's not quite clear enough. So I actually click the option and I can see Content Assistant has created additional suggested distractors. So maybe instead of another uh, set of locations, I wanna use a specific distance. So maybe I'm gonna use this uh, 1450 kilometers distance as a alternative distractor, click save, and now the question is updated. But not only maybe now is it ready to release uh, to users, at this point, Content Assistant's also learning from the experience of getting those updates from a designer so that it can improve its output in the future and get that much better at creating that kind of first pass or that first draft of instructional content. So again, that's a quick look at what we're working on when it comes to the idea of content automation and accelerating the content development process with our AI Content Assistant. So Tom, what did you think about Exonify's Content Assistant? That's a super exciting new piece of technology. I hadn't seen that before. Um, I could see lots of potential in terms of how uh, any number of different types of learning and development uh, groups could use this, or even at a much smaller scale, um, thinking of Exonify customers, maybe a store manager, for example, could come up with some really interesting quick hit courses that, that would help get their staff up to speed really quickly. So super exciting and congratulations on getting this launched. Thanks, and absolutely, the idea there, and we named it Content Assistant, is because it allows the people doing the work, instructional designers, like you said, maybe subject matter experts, store managers, it gives them that help to accelerate the process, get the first uh, set of pieces done using that source material, and then be able to tweak the results, tweak the questions before they ultimately uh, deploy them out, and it'll be exciting to see where we go with the technology moving forward. Super so cool. that's the... That's our 3B strategy. So as we said, you start with that borrow. How do we leverage the wisdom of the crowd through open source materials and subject matter expertise? Then how do you buy the right resources off the shelf from trusted development partners to solve a lot of those common foundational skill gaps? And then build when it's only the right decision when it comes to something that's a very specific, unique product process um, or service related uh, to your business and how you do your work every day. And the idea being that it's not one or the other, 
like I said, the real power behind this 3D model is that you combine the pieces together. So maybe sometimes you're going to buy a piece of content and then augment it with something that you borrow. Maybe you're going to build uh, something as a, a really complex new process within your business, but then also crowdsource some information from your subject matter experts along the way. So how do you combine those factors to, again, accelerate your ability to get solutions to the right people at the right time, maximize the value of those uh, resources, and then ultimately drive the impact you're looking to achieve within your business. And with that said, that's the end of part one. So we've taken a look at what are the real challenges or obstacles facing organizations when it comes to evolving the content strategy? How do you make content fit using a set of core principles? And then how to use a 3B approach to shift from a kind of a builder mentality to more of a curation, more agile content approach. So with that said, looking forward to part two, where are we going from here? Once you've got your content, how do you get it to people? So what's the connection between technology and content? We'll talk about that in our next session, as well as how do you then get people to engage? If you've got great content on the shelf, how do you get people to actually take it off the shelf and use it as part of their everyday work? And then how do you know if you're getting the value that you want to or need to get from your content investment? We'll talk about the idea of content health in our next conversation. And of course, if you're just really excited about Exonify and Open Sesame's partnership and talking about content, join us at Exonicom Live, where I'll be joined by Spencer Thornton, the SVP of curation from Open Sesame. We're going to, again, dig into this idea of how do you close the content gap, and especially when it comes to the challenge of reaching frontline employees with the right resources to help them be successful in their work. And of course, if you have any questions after today, feel free to reach out to myself. Tom, I'm volunteering you as well. If you'd like to reach out to Tom, any questions you have about Exonify, Open Sesame, content strategy in general, just let us know. And uh, we're, of course, always happy to help out. But with that said, thank you so much for hanging out, out with us for part one of our conversation about modernizing and evolving and elevating your content strategy. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. And until then, be well. Thanks, JD. That was super interesting.